Welcome to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com, where the Orchard of Wisdom shows are at your fingertips. It ignites your soul, your heart, your spirit, your mind, and your body with illumination from people who have made the journey before you. They're here now to help you on your journey, on your path of self-discovery. We are funded by you, the audience, and the people we interview. If you wish to support us, please go to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com and press on our Fund Action button. Anything is appreciated. We would like you to sit back and enjoy the shows. Here we go. I'm so happy. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome back to another edition of our Global Veteran Stories right here in selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest is Sarah Jane Geary. She's written the most beautiful story about her pilot, my pilot, a story of war, love, and ALS. Uh, There's quite a few stories to be told in that, the story of love, the story of ALS, and the story of war, all in one book. And for so many in the 1960s and 70s, there were turbulent times in the United States. And for Sarah Jane, it was a time when she fell in love with her college sweetheart, who became a pilot. She lived life from (laughs) 30,000 feet in the air, even when they were 10,000 miles apart. Her book, My Pilot, A Story of Love, War, and ALS, is a stirring memoir uh, that touches the hearts and allows us to live the couple's life who leaned on each other during tough times in war and in health, and who treasured their time together in raising a family and seeing the world. Um, You know, it's wonderful when people can share the stories like this, because what it does is it allows us to look at history and the impact that war has on everybody. And History books may give you the facts and the dates, but they don't give you the the real story or the meaning or the why. And when we actually look at war itself through the eyes of the people that have fought it and the impact that it has afterwards, the scars that it leaves, we really do see war from a different point of view. And so many people who went to war on any level, their love was tested. It's very, very hard for loved ones when the person who comes home to them isn't always the same person that went to war in the first place. And ALS are added on top of that. Well, there is a a challenge right there that only love can see you through. So welcome to the show, Sarah Jane. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, My dad, I was saying beforehand, uh, was a fighter pilot in the Second World War, a squadron leader. Um, He loved flying, uh, but it did take its toll on him. And back in that day, you know, when when you came home from the war, especially in Britain, it was stiff upper lip. What's, what's been done is done, and now get on with your life. And consequently, at the age of 45, he died of a heart attack. And we don't spend enough time on the people that have had to face some atrocities and such traumas and dramas that uh, when we don't know what they're going through. And so how do we know how to be supportive? So your love story started long before the war. Uh, college sweetheart, which is a wonderful story. And you really solidified that love there that kind of obviously took you through these turbulent waters. How did you guys meet? We met at a college in Iowa. Bernie came from Chicago and I was a St. Louis girl. Um, And we met there and we were attracted to one another. We fell in love. And I told my mother after my uh, sophomore year, I said, We want to get married. No, it was before my sophomore year. And she said, well, that's nice, honey, but how are you going to support yourselves in school? (laughs) So I I, I said, gee, I never thought of that. So I went home and Bernie continued school. He was in ROTC, which was compulsory then for two years. And I worked at the phone company and I saved my money for one year. I made $62.50 a week. And so when we got married, the beginning of his last semester, I moved up to Iowa to Cedar Rapids. We thought we were rich. I think Mm -hmm. I had about six hundred dollars. Back uh, then it had had some, you know, value to it. Right. (laughs) Oh, it was wonderful. I was 21. He was 22. So um, he finished his semester um, and then we waited for his pilot training class because he graduated as a second lieutenant from ROTC. You had to go two years if you were a fellow in those days. And then if you liked that, you could continue and major in that and get your um, 
your gold bar when you graduated. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. And then we worked while we waited for his pilot training class. And then from then on, we went to Texas and he was uh, a second lieutenant in the Air Force. So How long were you married before um, he was deployed? Well, let's see, we're married in 61 and he was deployed and actually 64, he went to Okinawa for three months. And then the following year, which were like war games, which I found out later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the following year, um, so it was only three or four years, you know, we, but we had known each other for two years before that. So. Right. It's still but, kind of a disruption, isn't it? You know, you know, of course it is. And when you decide to be an Air Force wife mm -hmm. and accept it, and he accepted it. We really didn't think about Vietnam, right? Uh, when we were in college, because you know, 1959, mm -hmm. 1960. But uh, boy, we realized what was happening. So it was a, a difficult time, but it was a learning experience for me. And yeah. I, you're young, and you're in love, and you're just ready to go, and you're going to do, you know, do something wonderful. And uh, but we didn't really realize what was to come, um, but we we had strength together and we believed in what he was doing as much as we could. Mm -hmm. We didn't see the politics beneath it all. Right. So many yeah. years later. Yes, exactly. So, but a young man with a, a very wonderful airplane that was just coming off of McDonnell Douglas, actually it was uh, the McDonnell Corporation in St. Louis. And he was in a hot jet and it was, fascinating he loved it but then you get down to brass tacks and what does that mean in your yeah. relationship yes so it was a growing experience it was, mm. uh, it was I, i've done a show with a, a couple of veteran um wives um, and um you know talking about them being deployed and you know you're left at home did, and, uh, and then you moved around a great deal and that it, it, you know it, never mind the soldier coming home with post-traumatic stress. So, you know, uh, having struggling to fit back into the world, it's hard on the people they leave behind because you never know, right? Until they're home, until their feet are on the ground, you know, uh, what's going to happen. And there's always a lot of what I call background stress because you can't let it up in the front. You can't be anxious up at front, but there's always that background stress, isn't there, when they're away from you and when they're fighting because you just don't know. You hope they're going to be one of the lucky ones to come home, but they're at war. You just don't know. It was a shock um, <clears throat> when we lost the first uh, two fellows in the squadron when he was over there <clears throat> one month and he was in a flight of three and he saw the plane go down. Mm. And I think that just <clears throat> changed everything. Mm -hmm. It brought a seriousness to it, yeah, um, and it, and it brought anxiety to me just to hear about it and know right. the ones. And there were other men that were lost in the squadron. We had things happen. Uh, one wife died; the fella had to come home. Um, another wife, her her baby. There were four of us expecting four babies when they were gone. Uh, he died of crib death. <sighs> Uh, so it was back and forth back and, and we would see him come back. And so it was a real, um, it was amazing experience. When I look back on it, when I decided to write my pilot, mm. I, I thought, uh, boy, I grew up fast. <laughs> right. What other option do you have? I mean, you're holding the fort. Yeah. And as I said, you can't be upfront. You've got to be positive. You've got to, you know, yeah. I, you know, I, I believe in he's coming home. And then there's always that hidden anxiety that's in there of, you know, especially when you hear others not coming home um, and, or are they going to come home injured? And it's, yeah. you're constantly in a sense, holding breath, aren't you? Oh yes. Yes. And thank goodness for the other wives. Yes. Uh, we had very good, uh, Jim and Sandy were our friends there and she had a two year old daughter like I did and she was pregnant like I was. Mm -hmm. And he and Bernie flew uh, as a co-pilot and pilot. Well, Bernard was a pilot. He was the fellow in the back seat. They call it the, the guy in the back seat. He did all the systems analysis and everything. He was a pilot too. So they were they were shot down together. Uh, they were rescued. It, it was such a traumatic time. And Jim had been um, shot down two other times. So it was three, actually three times. Uh, that's pretty serious. Yes. Punch out of an airplane and be rescued. So yeah. But, I'm always thankful 
when I, even when we came home and saw the POWs later mm -hmm. come off the plane in California, we knew some of the men that had been held in prison for years. Yeah. And I, I just became very, uh, very closer to God, even mm -hmm. because I was so thankful and so grateful. Mm -hmm. And I knew that anything ever that ever happened to our lives after that, this this would be our measure. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing could be worse than losing each other mm -hmm. by first married. So yes, that was it. We were thankful for everything, and there were a lot of rough times too after that. But it didn't measure up to the real things. So. Right. I don't think people really understand, you know, when we look at the glory of war and getting, you know, looking wonderful in the uniform and they're going off to fight for their country, you know, the ripple effect of who it affects. And, you know, for, for the wife holding the breath, is he going to come home? Is he going to come home whole? You know, uh, all of that, you know, your friends, because as they lose their friends, their colleagues, their cam you know, their comrades there, it's very, very difficult for them because then there's survival guilt. There's a whole lot of emotions that go through. But then that also you've got to be, you know, upfront and cheerful for the children. But then the children also like daddy's gone. Is daddy coming home? And then sometimes daddy doesn't come home. And so we, you know, we, we may glorify war, but we don't look at the cost that it is to the families that are doing it. And I think if we had more appreciation for what the, those families go through, would we be so quick to jump to into a war rather than into in a communication negotiation? I do agree with you. Um, and that's one blessing from my book, because I think it's shown readers that have, have talked to me about it, um, a special respect for the military. Yeah. And what you have to do, you have to go where they send you. Mm -hmm. And after the, um, after the POWs came back, those seven years or eight years that those women had to wait yes. and started protesting to get them back, there were, there were a handful of, more than a handful of divorces. Oh, yeah. People change. People change and talk oh. about PTSD. Yes. Uh, so we feel that um, because Bernard was let off, uh, asked to come home a month early, we didn't have him going back and forth to Vietnam all the time. And when it was over, that was kind of the general idea from the pilots. This war is going to last and we're going to be sent back. Mm. So the airlines were crying for pilots then. Right. And the jumbo jets had come in. Mm -hmm. And even my sister, who had been a TWA stewardess in the 50s, she would write Bernie and she'd say, oh, TWA is looking for pilots. You know, what are you going to do when you get back? So a lot of them did go with the airlines. Yeah. Uh, then when you hear about what's happened over in that, well, it used to be Afghanistan, the war and everything. They, this country sent our fellows back and forth all the yeah, time. I know. Bernard had, what, almost a little year over there, less than a year. Um, so I really feel grateful. Yeah. I mean, today, I mean, some of them have gone a very long time, nine months, nine months a year, 18 months at a I time. Know. It's not a healthy thing. It, it is not, not a healthy thing. You know, it, it's almost a disregard, um, you know, that their, their own sanity, their own quality of their family. And you talk about divorce. I think virtually every veteran that I've interviewed has had a divorce. And, you know, the main thing is they come back different. Yeah. And, the, you know, and the wives expect them to pick up from where they were. How can they? You're two different people now. The wives have had their own battlefront with, mm -hmm. you know, with every day and raising kids on their own and or, you know, the worry if they're going to come home. And then, of course, they, you know, the, the veterans, the soldiers themselves, they have been up at that front. So they're always alert, always kind of on point there. And it's very difficult. And we, some of them have formed some wonderful organizations in which to bring, you know, spouses back together and, and reconnect the family. But the, the, it wasn't even being talked about until the veterans themselves said, we need help in this department. Because yes. you can't expect that same person to come home, not after what they've seen. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Um, so we, you were very lucky that you, you know, you too, you know, fell back into the love that you had and you know didn't have to i mean i'm sure there were some adjustments i'm sure there was things that you had to work through but you worked through them absolutely and i think what helped me um was i had wonderful in-laws uh, mm. bernard's parents i had a support group my dad uh, my mother had died five months before he went over 
So my dad was kind of at loose ends. Mm. So if it weren't for my in-laws, um, it would have been a lot more difficult for me. We, I went to Chicago two Christmases when he was in Okinawa one year in Vietnam. And they were, you know, German immigrants. They were such wonderful Americans. Mm -hmm. and I, this was their, my daughter Lisa was their first grandchild and they were so excited. And then um, she came down when um, Paul was born and spent six weeks with me and he drove down. So I had a support. Yeah. A, a handful of wives in, in the squadron, uh, they chose to take their children and go home to their parents mm -hmm. and drive cross country and not be at, uh, at the base with the, fam with the military yes. family. Right. I, I like that idea mm -hmm. because I found that the, um, the protests and the things that were happening, yeah. I felt so out of it when I go to Chicago. Yes. Uh, and, and I would say, well, they don't know anybody that's in Vietnam. I, I wonder if they, you know, do they care? And I just felt so uh, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And when um, that Christmas, I went to church with my in-laws. They've been going there since I met in 1930. Um, and the sermon was political mm -hmm. about bombing North Vietnam. It was a terrible thing to bomb North Vietnam and all this stuff. And of course, uh, we, I wanted them to bomb North <laughs> Vietnam and I wanted those batteries to like Joan, Jane Fonda sat on it on the gunning battery. They were shooting down our pilots, mm -hmm. and, but we couldn't touch them. So oh, that all that interplay between yeah. the political part, it just got me and yes. upset me. And so I was glad I was back at McDill in, in the family because the military family, we understood each other. Right, so. exactly. Yeah. And okay, all right. Uh, folks, we are going to occasionally get a beep in the background there. She's using a different computer that she actually doesn't know how to get rid of the beep. So bear with us if you hear that beep. And maybe we can just consider it like an angel's beep coming through, agreeing oh, with what we're saying, right? <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, you know, I've, Politics and religion it always raises its head and, and there's always an argument about it or sometimes a justifiable argument. But the trouble is, it's the people that it affects that are that are caught up in it. And it's, uh, you know, they're sent to do a job, um, whether the Vietnam War was valid or not. It, you know, the, the point is they were in it. They yes. were in it fighting for their lives. And, uh, you know, the argument whether it should have been or shouldn't have been really came more to the front later. But at that time, they were there fighting what they thought was the enemy and trying to stay alive. And, you know, we, we have to understand that um, I don't care how strong they are, there's going to be a level of post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. coming back because there's always going to be triggers. There's always going to be a different way they look at life. They're always going to have that thing being on alert. Mm -hmm. And, you know, however successful, I mean, I interviewed a guy many years ago for different reasons we couldn't air it, which is a pity. Um, but he was saying that he was drafted to Vietnam and uh, he didn't want to go, but he was, he had to go. And he was in charge of the big machinery that kind of made the roads, you know, for oh. the military to go through. And he said there was one time there was a young boy there with a grenade and he had to get out and his job was to shoot that kid before the grenade got off. And he said, I couldn't do it. And he said, thank God the kid ran off. He said, I couldn't do that. You know, mm -hmm. and it, it, he came back and he opened up a business and he did exceptionally well. And it's only when he retired that the post-traumatic stress of what had happened came back to him. So we may see them as all bravado and, and, and you know, gregarious and successful in what they do, but it's always going to tap them on the shoulder somewhere, in some way, uh, manifest it maybe through disease or through, through mental anguish, through behavior. There's always going to be something that will come through. And I think if we're aware of that and aware of the signs, we can be more nurturing, caring, and more aware of what to do. I agree. Uh, one instance that Bernie had over there, in um, he was at Cameron Bay on the South China Sea, and um, he was his uh, group, his flight was asked to support an army, the army down on the ground, and, and they were fighting Viet Cong. And uh, there was a famous guy. His name was uh, 
Bill Carpenter, he was a captain and he ran this unit. Uh, he had been a big star at West Point. He was called the Lonesome End, a very popular, uh, good soldier. Mm -hmm. And he called, there were three F4s up above, and he called them to drop napalm on him and his group because oh. the VC were coming in so close. Mm -hmm. And so, um, well, they did. And there was a forward air controller called the FAC. You probably know what they are. And the light planes that go fly down close and mm -hmm. tell the jets what they want to bomb. And he says, don't, don't worry, guys. He says, you got some friendlies, but, uh, but, we, but we got the VC. You know, don't worry. Well, Bernard wrote me this long letter. He had a terrible time with it. Um, as it turned out, uh, when he got back, he went to, uh, I think it was Clark, they sent him for R&R &R a little bit, um, he and his co-pilot. And when he got back to the base, they said um, the Army had sent a, uh, another captain over to headquarters at Cameron to thank them because nobody was killed. That was a misnomer. The fact said you got friendlies, but you really didn't. And they, they went through this whole week of, I mean, Bernard couldn't eat. It was right. Yeah. And so his PTSD, I guess, was um, was there in that moment. And yeah. it lasted that week. Um, he never really talked about it because everything came out. You know, they were wounded, but they were fine. It was on Lock Magazine, mm -hmm. stories about it. Um, but that was a real close uh, hurt for him. The mm -hmm. fact that he could have killed his own own men actually yeah exactly yeah and you know i think that's what kind of got my dad is is not his own men but the innocence i mean my father yeah. <laughs> their their um my family owned a timber company import export timber and they worked a great deal with germans and with russia and everything oh. else he was actually in germany when the war broke out living with a german countess and he had to be smuggled out Right. And now suddenly people who are his friends, because not all Germans are enemies, folks. Let's know where the enemy is. Right. Many Germans were against the war um, and they had to get him out. And now all of a sudden he's bombing them. Yes. Right. So, you know, there is always going to be a psychological thing. We are oh, so much of us, our soldiers, our military, you know, we put guns in the hands, we teach them how to kill and, and you know, how to fight. But do we prepare them? for yes. the mental aspect of it and then when something happens we wonder why mm -hmm. no that yeah that's true and uh but i i wanted to discuss it further with him when he came home he talked about it for a little while and there were a lot of other incidences and things that i didn't know about mm -hmm. and actually i didn't want to know about yeah so you know i didn't plead with him to do that. but i think the camaraderie uh, probably your father felt the same way with the pilots together yeah. lasted well, 50 years. We had reunions all the time and it was really wonderful. It was remarkable. Um, That's a gift in itself. I mean, a, you know, to live that long. I mean, as I said, with my dad, all his squadron were gone. He was the last one and he died at 45. Yeah. So there was no one, you know. So, we, you know, we were very much cut off from any of his squadron. I've tried to get information actually, you know, um, from the RAF uh, on him. But it's, um, I think having that, that camaraderie where you can still meet year after year, uh, where people don't know what you're talking about. There, there's a silent language, you know, you know, and it's that, you know, we've made it another year, you know, it's, I think it's something that never, ever leaves them. And, and you know, something that when, when they get together, they understand. Nobody else can understand but them the way they understand. Even, yes, and even when Bernard was the commander of the Air National Guard in uh, West Hampton, New York, West Hampton Beach, 106 uh, recovery and rescue. And, and even before that, he was there for many years and we used to have an Air National Guard conferences in New York City and we would go in and we at the big old Pennsylvania hotel where Glenn Miller used to play. Mm. Uh, and we all had our suites and with the bar set up and people could come through. And I can't tell you the number of times I walked in the room and and the pilots were going like this, and he went like this. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're reliving the whole thing. Yes. Yeah, and, and then he'd say, uh, he said, "See that guy over there? He's an ace, or he's this, or he's that." Yeah. And I was kind of in awe, really. Yeah. But it was something I couldn't touch. Uh, so no, people... but I, and I think at that time there was also a bit of a disconnect of you know that the wives' battles 
on the home front and you know and you know the the soldiers battles you know it, that there was no attention spent on the wives battles you know you had them home that was great but again the whole navigating through who they are now and you know the the post-traumatic stress that they would go through and you know there has to be the bridging of the gap there because everybody has gone through their own battlefront yes and they do it they do it in different ways being yes. separated and we uh, increased our love uh, for one another because we wrote letters. And when yeah. I read Bernard's letters, it prompted me to write the book because I saw his personality come through and he bared his soul and, mm. and things that he never would probably do after he came back because you just don't talk like that. But he had to write it all out because tomorrow people might not be there. And that's and, a beautiful, um, a beautiful gift. Um, to the two of you to be yeah. so vulnerable, to have that kind of connection, but also to have that kind of memory, you know, because it is the love story. It is the beautiful connection and it is that true honesty. And, you know, I think the greatest gift you can give someone that you love is your vulnerability. Oh, yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, when I moved to, um, to New Jersey uh, from Long Island after 40 years and I was going through my, um, all my scrapbooks and the letters and I had saved his letters in this old tin box and I was rereading them and it was as if he he was in the room yes he was there with me yeah laughing and all all sorts of things so um yeah it was I said I've just got to pass this down this is a legacy and I have to pass it down yeah so, and, and I it's started writing and I hear a ringing again <laughs> it's okay, It'll go off, go to your message. Um, and, it, and it's not just your love story. It becomes for other people than maybe even going through, you know, the Afghanistan war or anything else. It becomes that, that recognition of other people's love stories, you know, and it becomes that inspiration to keep the love alive. But, you know, peop young people today whose spouses are in the military and they're maybe off fighting Afghanistan here, there and everywhere, where, wherever the next war is encouraging them not just to have that little video chat they have which is wonderful but to write to each other right to be able to say things to each other that you can't always say face to face be able That's to say right. things from the heart and soul and to keep those letters and then to revisit those letters i think when they get home when the time is right you know it, it i think as you said it made you fall in love even more because you chose to keep that connection together through letter writing we don't see enough letter writing today you know it's there's something about writing by hand and sending something that comes from the heart that i think is just such a beautiful intricate language that speaks louder than words sometimes i i have three ring binders this stack <laughs> of letters and uh it, they still amaze me every now and then i take them out and i I had to be very particular what I was going to put in the book. But one day I was, uh, one Sunday I was watching book TV and I was ironing in my living room. And I heard this fellow named um, Andrew Carroll and he wrote a book called War Letters. I don't know if you've heard of it, but. No, no. Uh, and, the, and he was being interviewed at the World War I Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. And he started this project, the Legacy Project, mm. about how important keeping war letters, even from the Civil War, mm. was. And it just, I, here I was in the middle of writing the book. And of course, I just couldn't put the iron down and I took notes <laughs> and I bought the book and I read the book. But it's true. Um, uh, it is passing a legacy in history. Yes. And, and so people that read the book, he would speak all around the country. They'd go up in the attic or they'd ask a relative and they'd get those old letters out. And they're, they're very, they're wonderful. Um, and so it really encouraged me. And I said, yes, I am on the right track. Yeah. Because this has to be told. I, yeah. I want to leave something of value yeah. and, uh, after I leave. And I want them to know what their grandpa was like when he was 26. Right. Um, and then, of course, it became my story, too. Yes, of course. It followed our marriage. And yes. so it became our story. And they, um, I think they're richer for it. And I'm, I'm very blessed that uh, something that I wrote can touch people's lives, mm -hmm. maybe make a difference. Wait, you know, the people reading it, and reading those stories, um, they might not have anybody in the military, but I think it gives them a better insight 
into those that do serve the country, um, into war itself, into how to keep that love alive. Because, you know, it, I don't care if you're going to war or not, every day can be a battle. And, you know, keeping love alive in a relationship seems to be more and more of a challenge today than I think ever before. And I think it's that communication is so utterly important. And whether, you know, it, why can't you write your loved one whom you live with every day a letter? <laughs> right? Why do oh. you have to wait until they're gone away? Write them a love letter. Everybody loves to pick up something and read it and hold on to it and treasure it. You know, it's it's a tangible thing that you can revisit and it reignites that feeling again. So why don't we encourage people to write letters to each other even now? Well, we went to, uh, we were in our, oh, I guess mid thirties and we went to something called Marriage Encounter. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was, uh, we're not Catholic, but it was by the Catholic Church started this and my sister recommended it. And it's when that, when you go on a, um, a weekend, Mm -hmm. And you have a couple sitting down and talking about the problems of marriage and how, how to make your marriage more successful. And, and like you say, stay in love mm -hmm. uh, and do it well. Um, and we had to spend a lot of time in our room writing in notebooks to one another. Right. And it's the first time we did that since the Vietnam era. You know, yeah. we're sitting there writing and then we have to switch and read. Yes, he wrote, and we're all prompted by the questions of, of the hosts. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was awesome. It was yeah. so eye opening. Yeah. Uh, and I just ran across those uh, notebooks the other day and I'm reading them. And um, I love to read old letters. But yes. these were so personal. Wow. Yeah, uh, it, it was wonderful. So, so there are things today, but um, my late son uh, was in um, uh, Iraq and Kuwait, and they emailed one another, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they sent texts and email, yes. all that kind of thing. But um, it's much better to have it on paper, I think. It's, yeah, and you know, if you do modern, and, you know, um, email each other, you can print out the emails, right? Oh, yes, you can. It's, I print out the ones I write. <laughs> <laughs> I so you, so. And anything can be printed out, but I think it's that, that beautiful encouragement of writing to one another. Because, yeah. you know, I always, I always say that, you know, if before, when you're when having an argument, step away. Uh, and then if somebody's not been able to hear you, write how you feel. Now, there's two benefits to this. One, you're going to write all your anger and your angst, and you're going to reread it and go, you know, I don't really want to say that. I don't really want to say that. And then you're going to write really what you really do want to say. And it's not on the attack and it's not being defensive. It's kind of trying to get your message across. And you ask your partner to read it and think about it before responding to it. And I think if we did that, if we just slow down, wrote to each other of what we're trying to articulate that we can't do verbally because we're on the defense or on the attack or feeling heard, you know, yeah. that writing to each other and then really reading it and then coming together because you don't want the angst you don't want the anger that splits you apart and so you know spend the anger in the words to get rid of that and then what you're truly trying to say and that opens up on both sides the ability to truly listen to one another that, that's true in fact eisenhower during world war ii wrote to mamie they wrote a lot mm -hmm. uh and i was just reading uh, about that in the last couple of years um i've been reading a lot of i like military history. And I like to read about Eisenhower World War II. Um, and he would bear his soul to her mm -hmm. and talk about what he was going to do when he got out. Yes. And we did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but life was going to be afterwards. Yeah. And uh, so, and uh, George Washington and his wife wrote all the time. And the, oh, the tragedy is she burned, she got rid of all the letters. Uh, no, so, you're what burning her, history. You're that. burning history. I know. Uh, and she was with him for every winter campaign when he, you know, would stay somewhere during the winter. Uh, but uh, still, I'll think of what he. Oh God, that's throwing oh. away history. I hate to hear that. I'm, I'm a bit of a hoarder when it comes to things like that. Me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it is history. You know, whether it's just a sweet little note or a lovely letter or a letter of of intent of what's going on, it is it is the journey in life. You're documenting the journey, 
Mm -hmm. And then other people can benefit from that wisdom on that journey or that process of that journey or some poignant moments of that journey. That's, you know, that's why we love historical type books or historical type stories. You know, we still tell war stories. And how do we tell them? We generally pick two or three characters where we're going to be talking about their journey. And whether we've been through it or not, we connect and we feel through their journey and everything that they go through. And that's, it's less about the bang, bang, shoot, shoot, and more about the people going through the journey. And we want that connection. Please don't throw things away, folks. <laughs> well, I was, I was uh, chagrined when I found out that uh, Bernie was told when he went to Vietnam to burn my letters because there were um, Vietnamese that worked in the Quonset huts and worked on the base. And they didn't want any letters lying around from wives at home with uh, return addresses or anything like that. Now, some of the some of the guys said, "The heck with that! I'm keeping her letters." But Bernie didn't, and I kind of and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen who I was at age 25. Right, exactly. And the uh, thing is, they could have burnt the envelope with the addresses. I mean, yeah. you know, the actual letter. How is that going to come back on anyone? I don't know. Well, they had orders, and they did this, and. But I do have the ones from Okinawa and I have the year uh, I worked at, at home, we wrote back and, oh, I just had more fun reading those at the yeah. same time. They were in the same box and we had more fun. He was in college and I was there and uh, we were, we were cut ups. <laughs> My yeah. letters were hysterical. So were his. So, so uh, I, I saved those. Um, and now I'm uh, researching my dad's parents and um, Missouri and Yay. in Sedalia, Missouri. And I'm reading love letters from my grandfather to my grandmother in eight, 1898. Oh, how fascinating. And it's wonderful. Yes. It, of course, I have to figure out the handwriting. It's very formal, the way they learned to do it mm -hmm. with the pen, mother of pen. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've learned more about them than I ever knew when, when they were alive. Yes. Just, you know, I didn't know that my grandmother was even a teacher. Mm. Uh, she died when I was 13. She taught in a one-room schoolhouse. Right. And although he was a lawyer and a doctor, he was a teacher too. So they, this was down in uh, the Ozark area of Missouri. Mm. There was oh, a yeah. wonderful book, um, R.F. Delderfield, Horseman Riding By. And it's about a guy oh, that, can, that, oh, it's beautiful. Um, I think you would really enjoy it. It's, you know, there's, there's several books to them. Um, and it's about a guy that comes back from the Boer War. And uh, he, he inherits um, a steel factory and he sells it and kind of buys a valley and becomes, you know, the, um, oh God, what would you call it? The manor, the head of the manor. And it's, it's about the evolution from that time into the 60s of the, the two wars and how everything changed in the valley from people working up at the main house, a little bit like a Downton Abbey type thing. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and many years ago, they did do a TV series about it um, back in the 80s, I think. But it's a beautiful book because I learned more about the process of English history. Going, yeah. listening, you know, reading that book than I did from class because class was boring. You know, mm -hmm. I, it was just facts. This, that, there was no connection to it. So why, you know, why was I interested in it? But when you're reading about historical events, through mm -hmm. storytelling and through how it affected people's lives and how things you know change so radically because in those 50 years that the from centuries of people working the land and then working at the manor house into now working elsewhere altogether you know seeking totally different lifestyles and how it completely unraveled that particular lifestyle fascinating totally fascinating so i think you know please don't throw any of those historical things away because they are a life lesson for us and how history changes us and it's it's not always about this happened at this time and this happened at that time when you read it through the people's eyes of how it's changing their lives that history just makes so much more sense and has so much more connection for me i jump, I jump right from the letters uh, my grandfather's letters into research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because he happened to be going up he traveled with his business up to chicago for the uh, world's fair the first one in chicago uh he was at this he went to that and i saw it through his eyes as a passerby or a tourist or yeah. giving first impression 
Yes. But so then I had to read more about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just led to a lot of um, exciting moments for me, picturing him doing that and wondering what it was like then. Then I started researching trains and and this this is not that good for me because <laughs> I could really get into history. So. You go down, you, you go down your little rabbit hole there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop. you've got enough. You've got enough. So. Yeah. yeah uh, um, my uncle had uh, gone back and done the. This is before ancestral.com had gone back and researched his family name, which was Stanley, um, going right back to when they started keeping records at 500 BC. And the churches then kept records of birth, marriages, deaths, and things. Up until then, they kind of really didn't do much. And it was uh, really interesting that the family name and the, the family dynamics have been around for quite a number of generations beforehand and were, you know, um, government administrators or lawyers or writers. And, you know, my brother is a writer and, uh, you know, there were public speaking people and it's kind of that common thread that's kind of woven through mm -hmm. historically few people. And I think it just, it's not just, um, we did ancestry with my daughter, um, when she was pregnant and it was quite fascinating because my ex-husband is Chinese. She's married somebody that's more Scottish. I'm quarter Scottish. So it was interesting to see what came oh, out yeah. and there was 1% Korean in there. So it's like, you really kind of the hodgepodge, but that tells you kind of a little bit about how much of moving around the world we did, you know, to, to mm -hmm. get all of those different things there and it opens up to, you know, wanting to know the story of how how do you get one percent you know korean you know who was where at one time you know that affected that and i think we if we're not fascinated by the historical stories of journeys that we've taken how are we learning we're seeing in schools now you know the holocaust never happened um you've seen so many books being diminished and not being spoken about we repeat history if we don't learn from history and mm -hmm. I think history needs to be out there. And when it's told through a personal story of connection, mm -hmm. you know, we are more inclined to learn from that because we feel we can relate to it or it really touches us in a way that really then ignites a wonderment to know more. Yes, the curiosity is there yeah. and stop teaching about it. In fact, yeah. after I moved here, to, um, I have a separate house in a retirement community and um, our activities director said that down the street the history teacher is teaching uh, vietnam in high school and they want their kids to interview people who were in the era and who were in the protesting movement and i said well that's funny they only want to interview the protesters yeah. i said well my husband was a pilot over there and i said i wasn't a protester but i have a story to tell so i didn't think anything of it and i got a call and the gal came down and she was a senior in high school she had questions from the teacher and she set up her little um, tripod there with her iPhone. This is about six years ago. And she has started asking me these questions and she was really surprised to hear the other point of view. You're right. Uh, and she hadn't heard it in the history books or anywhere else. So uh, at the end of the year, I thanked her and everything. And she went back and I had to sign a disclosure saying, I do not want this shown anywhere except the classroom. Mm -hmm. I want it on video or on Facebook. So uh, uh, she graduated and moved on. And um, my activities director came one day and she said, I just want you to know that the teacher said they vote, all the kids brought their interviews and they had, they viewed them all of all these people and their grandparents or whomever. Um, and yours was voted the best. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I, I know why, because it was a different viewpoint. Right. And, and, and that's the, there's always a different view. Yeah. yeah. There's, you know, we've got to understand the whole story. We've got to look at it from all points of view. Yes, absolutely. I Otherwise, agree. you know, all we're getting is one side. And, you know, that one side is valid. The other side is valid. Mm -hmm. But if we don't hear both sides of the story, how are we actually going to get to the common denominator, the true understanding of what's going on? That's true. Yeah. So and very, very important. Yeah, it's that's why I really uh, saved so many things. I saved newspapers at the time, Look Magazine, because somewhere along the line, after I'd been there for a month or so, I realized I'm a living, I am in the living history. Mm. The first time that they've shown what's happening on the battlefield on TV, 
They've shown the protesters. A man burned himself outside the White House. Right. This was early on in the war. Yeah. And it just shocked me. And I thought, boy, that this is something because I had read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, mm -hmm. uh, read William Shirer's books. Um, so uh, I was, wow. I said, I'm saving all this. And I'm so yeah. glad I did. Yes. <laughs> About yeah, it. yeah, because now it becomes that historical lesson for others. Did you yeah. ever do the history of your father's parents? Did they come over, a, a, you know, before the First World War or after the First World War? Your, well, your, your husband's par uh, parents, me. Oh, uh, my husband's parents, well, his mom was from southern Germany and his dad was from Bremen, northern Germany, and they met over uh, in the States. Uh, he was a pharmacist, but he came to the States and he couldn't afford his license. They had to, he had to go back to school and get a license and he didn't. So he became an engineer, kind of worked his way up, didn't have the credentials, but he, he worked for a company that he did that kind of thing. She was a, uh, a nanny for a rich uh, family and they met in church mm -hmm. in 1931, I think, in Chicago. There was a big German settlement there and they lived within walking distance of the church. Um, Did, were they both in the First World War in Germany? Well, my father-in-law's story is uh, actually I read about this for four chapters and, and decided to take that part of the Geary history out and make another history of it separately. Mm -hmm. he, he lived to be 102. Wow. He lived with us his last eight years. And all this time he told wonderful stories. When he was a young boy in World War I, um, the, the uh, doctor came to their uh, uh, school and said, these boys are undernourished. We're going to send them out to farms in Germany and they're going to work there and get healthy. World War I. So he went out to a farm as his brother did. And he not only worked on the farm, but they got Russian prisoners there. It was his job as a nine year old or eight to guard the Russian prisoners. He would have to go across the the river, open up their dormitory, which was an old house with a big key he wore around his neck, bring him back. And of course, the Russian prisoners loved it there. Yes. They the food they wanted. They, they made their own shirts, these big billowing. Mm -hmm. And he's, he described it all. Uh, so his adventures were wonderful. And he described uh, when the Kaiser would come to, to, um, to town and where the big church was, where he was confirmed. And the Kaiser would come in with his helmet and everything. And his dad put him on his shoulders to say that that's the Kaiser. Remember, remember. Uh, he had a lot of uh, wonderful uh, tales to tell. Shall yeah, we say. and a totally different view on war itself at that time. Well, that's his mother. He was the oldest of five. Mm -hmm. And his mother said, um, Rudy is R Rudolph. She said, I think you should go to America because there's going to be another war. Right. And he was the one that she chose appropriately now that I think of it mm -hmm. to go to America. And he was uh, 21, I think 22. Um, and as it turned out, none of his, well, I, we took the kids over to meet the family and we saw some of the aunts and so on and, and his brother, Paul, but um, nobody else came over. Mm -hmm. Came to visit, but he made America his home. And he was an amazing person. Mm -hmm. He didn't speak the language, but he loved Mark Twain translated in German. He said, <laughs> I always wanted to see the medicine because <laughs> he read about it as a boy, and I just loved that. Mm -hmm. so, I from, so, but he, he was terrific. Um, she differently, she had a, a different upbringing. Um, and after World, after World War II, um, it was difficult for them, of course. Yes. And her sister and, uh, came back. He came back from Russia and they decided not to move. There was a time when right after World War II, a lot of them knew what was happening and they moved way over to uh, the American side of Germany. Mm -hmm. They knew what was happening, Yeah, but they didn't. The sister stayed there. So Bernard in 1972 took his mother back to Lobenstein and uh, on the Turinger Belt in Southern Germany and visited uh, in Weimar um, his aunt and his story of being in the communist country and living and sleeping on a couch in her apartment would just, well, it would shake your boots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For living. And of course, 
His mother had sewn all the money into her girdle and all over, mm -hmm. caked to them. They had no refrigerator, no nothing. And, and someone would come to town and, and everybody would run to the window. She's got oranges in that bag. Where'd she get them? And they'd all run out. To and Bernie really had some great stories to tell. And then when his dad moved in with us the last eight years, we had Lithuanian caregivers, mm -hmm. live-ins. And uh, I learned a lot about yeah. living under communism. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I harp on a lot in my shows and, and do an awful lot of shows on youth, but also on elders, is that I don't want to see this bridge, get, you know, this big gap. I want when we put the elders and the youth together and the elders share that wisdom and that knowledge and all that beautiful history to the children, you are fortifying those children. You are allowing their imaginations to grow. You are allowing them to be more exploratory. You're allowing them to yes. be aware. I don't want to see that happen again. And, you know, yes. it's something that I think that you see in some cultures is very revered. You know, the elders are very revered and they're there to teach the young ones. But you know, in the Western society, you put out to pasture and, you know, and it's not it's not revered. And I think that's something that needs to change. You know, we, we need to see that bridging of the gap because we don't, we can't lose that history. We can't lose those stories because those stories have paved the road, you know, for today and also for tomorrow. And we want that tomorrow to be a smoother road. I'm really anxious to uh, finish, actually make the new story of the Geary's. And uh, one, one story that his dad told, I put in the book, and uh, his mother used to send him out in the country. They were so, they were starving during World War I. And because uh, Britain had, had blockaded uh, the country. And so she would uh, raise bees and she would have him take the honey on the train up to the farms in Germany and barter it for potatoes. Right. So he always told this story about coming back. He was a young boy and he had a big sack of potatoes and he got on the train and everyone sat around on the benches along the side and he dragged this big bag over and he sat down and he put it underneath his, guarded it with his legs. Yes. And the big, the big train fella comes in and he says, what's just us, you know? Yeah. And he wanted his potatoes and Rudy wouldn't move. He said, you get that? He said, nope, nope, nope. And all of a sudden, uh, this is the one thing he remembered in his 90s. He said, those, some of those men got up that were sitting there and they stuck up for me. And they mm -hmm. said, you leave your hands off that boy. Yeah. And the fella walked out. And he always remembered that because uh, they lived in, in all that dictatorial society. And yes. wow, here he was. And he was yeah. always like that, always after that. He knew what he wanted. Right. So. Yeah, so he and you know, like you know, you look at uh, the opulence of today, and to, to share a story of you know exchanging honey for potatoes, which were life saving. And you look at how people are so complacent about food today. You know, if they understood the starvation of yesterday, maybe they'd be more appreciative of the abundance they have today. Oh, they called it the turnip winter in Germany in World War One because mm -hmm. they had no potatoes; they had turnips. All the food went to the soldiers. Yes. So yeah. therefore, my mother-in-law was a fabulous German cook, but she would never look at turnips. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they ate. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it can only go so far. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, the ALS, when did that happen? Well, it happened uh, after Pan Bernard was furloughed from Pan Am for a total of 15 years back and forth with that airline. And when it finally went bankrupt, uh, the Delta Airlines bought uh, the pilots and the crew for international travel. Mm -hmm. He just, as he always said, he just took off his white hat and put on the black hat work for mm -hmm. Delta. But as he was working for Delta, his back started bothering him, the lower back. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had some problems with it. He had to take a little leave, go to the doctor and so on. Now, I, I think that was kind of the beginning of the ALS. Mm -hmm. And th this happens to a lot of people. It's very hard to diagnose. Yeah. Anyway, he worked with Delta for quite a few years because Pan Am really didn't get much of a pension. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of married the airlines. It wasn't quite fair to the Pan Am people. But anyway, um, so uh, I knew something was wrong. Uh, and I think he felt it too. And it was, wasn't until a friend uh, that he hadn't seen in a while came and said to me after we were together for a few days, what's the matter with 
Bernie. He, he walks differently. Mm-hmm. And that just was a, a red light going off. Mm-hmm. Paul and Lisa and I, we said, okay, I gotta do something about it. Come on, dad, gotta do it. So we, uh, we started off with doctors from a, my niece who was a, a nurse practitioner uh, and different people. Um, we found a wonderful pulmonologist and she led to a wonderful uh, neurologist and at the hospital of special surgery and takes six months to a year to diagnose sometimes. Mm. And it was probably six or eight months going back for tests. It's a process of elimination because ALS can strike you in different ways. It's spinal and the brain uh, deadens the nerves. So there's right. no muscle about. Right. But sometimes it hits you with the bulbar with swallowing and him. Yeah. His with the spinal with his legs and his coordination and his, and his using his hands. So it was a, he was diagnosed in um, February of 2012. And he died uh, the next July. Oh, really? 2013, yeah. Through the ALS? Uh, it was complications because they uh, invented a pacemaker to put on your diaphragm, which was hopeful for ALS, mm-hmm. to help them breathe. And he decided maybe he, would he be a candidate? And they said, yes, you would. So he went for the operation. They also put a feeding tube in him. Up to this time, there was no wheelchair, everything he just... Mm-hmm. He was that old fighter pilot uh, face, you know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he went went in and had the operation. My daughter came out and stayed with me. And uh, five days later, he got up and he said, I, I can't breathe. I can't stand it. We took him to the emergency room. And he was in the hospital for five days. And he never came out. Oh. It was because he had blood clots in his lung because of ALS weakening all of the mus- muscles. Yeah. When you say die of ALS, it just takes away so many things. Yeah. But you could say he died of ALS. Because if yeah. he hadn't had that, it may not have happened. Yeah, the ALS uh, complications. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. But how, uh, how old was he? 74. Mm, young age. Yeah. It was, a, it was too young. And we just got a group out um, on Long Island uh, called ALS Ride for Life. Mm-hmm. And the Pendergast were a couple. And the fellow had had ALS for 27 years. Wow. They raised millions of dollars, riding for life, going in the wheelchair down to Washington, D.C., doing this and that. Um, So they started a caregiving group and a grassroots organization to help ALS people and their caregivers on Eastern Long Island. Yeah. And so that's what I'm donating uh, proceeds of my book to ALS. Wonderful. And they, were just, they saved my life because I had somewhere to go yes. to talk to. What will I do? How will I support it? Mm-hmm. And they sat around the table and it could have been a father, a son, a grandparent. One of the people there, they had a loved one that had ALS. And if that person would pass on, they'd, they'd come back and they'd say, well, we've got a van. Who would like to, to have a van all set up? They pass yeah. things around and help each other. Yes. This was so important to me because I knew nobody that had it. I, right. I read about Lou Gehrig, yeah. uh, but I didn't uh, know. So yeah, it was, it was an eye opener. I like to go back to their fundraisers and yeah. Um, and you know that's you know that's something I pointed out earlier, like with the veterans and so many other organizations. Because I'm a big one on on you know raising our gift to children and the Forgotten Children series. You know, it's the people that see the need. And, and a government isn't going yeah. to get behind it and they create the platform of support. And, you know, it's those people that are making a difference. It's those people that are being supportive because very often if you wait for government, it's all going to be too late. And, you know, sometimes the impact that they have does change government, but, you know, it's politics is politics and it's more about self-interest than public interest. And so to see people step up and create those organizations to help people in those arenas I have such admiration for them because they know what it's like and they know what people are going through and they're there to support them so the more we support them doing their great work the more difference they're making in other people's lives right which is important and everybody deserves dignity and support and when you are amongst an arena that understands what you're going through, they're not only going to give you the support, but they're going to give you the dignity in going through it. And I think that's very important. It is. And they're going to give you a way of living with it. 
Yeah. Uh, and I was surprised to learn when I was uh, watching a program recently about PAWS for vets, P-A-W-S. Yes. For care dogs. Yes. For PTSD victims. Yeah. And I learned that the VA and our government won't pay for it. No. Dogs no. are expensive. They have to raise money. To, you know, we have to pay. Yes. To help these men because the VA won't do it. And they yes. say it will reduce the um, medication 80%. Yeah, and but you know, if pharma is is lobbyists, they pay for the politicians, and they want to see their drugs that are exponentially expensive to go anywhere else. And uh, you know, let's just drug them instead of support them in other ways. I've actually done a show on you know on uh, they call comfort dogs here in, in Victoria, and uh -huh. uh, and they're trained uh, specifically for veterans. And uh -huh. uh, you know, I got to interview a couple of the veterans. Um, and it was just you know amazing what difference it's made in their life and the confidence that oh. they have, and they're just literally going out as opposed to hiding in. Yes. And so it makes such a difference. And animals are oh, what a gift they are to us. The understanding that they have. Yes, they're trained, um, just like blind dogs would be trained. And there's deaf dogs and all of that. They're all trained to, to hone those skills. But the sheer love that they give, and the companionship, and you know the unquestionable you know, um, devotion to that person is just is so empowering. It is. It is. And I, I love dogs. My daughter has one. Mm -hmm. I'm going with her in a two days to get another one in Pennsylvania. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's wonderful. Um, and I was surprised. But then I wasn't that surprised because it took the, gov uh, the government a long time to recognize ALS is a comp uh, a comp compensatory disease mm -hmm. uh, because they pay for uh, just uh, pay vets for maladies such as tinnitus for the ears being mm -hmm. around jet engines right uh, his friend uh, Jimmy his partner in Vietnam came down with Parkinson's they recognize Parkinson's um, so they get disability compensation for that and Right before, and Jim used to call Bernard all the time when he found out he had ALS and say, I'm hoping that VA is going to recognize ALS while they finally did. Mm -hmm. So, but it takes just a lot of proof. Way so like, much red tape. Be exposed to Agent Orange and all this, and they won't really say, <laughs> no. you know, that they don't, they don't own up to it. They don't own oh. the mistake. So, you know, this is where it's important, where government likes to hide things. It never happened, la, la, la. This is where it's important for the individual like yourself. In the writing of the book, yes, you're writing your love story, how you kept your love alive. You're writing about his war story, you know, what he went through. You're writing about the ALS. Um, but through all of that, you are teaching so many lessons and you're supporting so many people on so many different levels. And it is because of people like that and coming to share on podcasts like this that we are out there with that knowledge that you know hopefully will keep on going because government isn't interested so we have to be the voice for the people and let them know what is happening you know, and how we could support each other and you the writing of the letters i encourage people to do that whether whether somebody's in the military or not because you know those love letters putting yes. them away revisiting them you know you've had an argument you go pick up a love letter and you read it to each other how can you not just drop the <laughs> argument and get back into love again. And it, it serves such a purpose. And it is it is the, the journal of your lives together. And that is a wonderful gift to your children and to your grandchildren. Yes. Because that then becomes, you know, what, what was grandma like? Or what did this? Or what did you do, mom? And it's all very well telling them with just little snippets of it. In fact, my mm -hmm. own daughter, I was about to write a book very much on the work that I do and all of that. And she said, no. That's your second book. Your first book is your own story. And yes. I, and it, it, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, harder one to write, but it's important, I think, because not only to my kids, but it is that for somebody reading it, like as you said before we came on air today, you know, how somebody sent you an email on how much the book meant to them. And it's just knowing that it's had an impact on somebody, that it's pivoted them or it's enlightened them or it's just cheered them up or it's given some sort of meaning is the reason why we do things right i think so i think so and i i have uh always written about uh on my travels and i'm just going through my old travel journals and i'm so surprised and so thrilled 
because I put every detail down, what I was thinking, what we did. Um, and my deep You're thought, a historian and you don't know it. Yes. I, I just like, I like <laughs> You <before>. missed your calling. <laughs> Never my, too late. <laughs> uh, one of my aunts in Missouri was too, and we, I called her a, a closet writer because it, uh, announced to me, my grandparents were in their 80s. She sat them down and said, tell me your life story. And she wrote it down on legal pads. Uh -huh. So these came to me when they all died. Wonderful. And I have a whole closet full of them. And that's why I'm so excited to start on that too, because yeah. that's another part that my grandkids don't know. What right. about the Palmer family in Missouri? Yes, yes exactly. I wrote, book, I wrote a book in 2012 about my mother's family in Minnesota, in Nolan's. I had a lot of material. But uh, yeah, I, I like the living history too. So no, I, I definitely do. And you know, we watch movies, we watch TV shows, we read books, and the more connective the more real it is the more we're drawn in yes and the more we feel it and you know take and you very often will see you know a book that has been written that's made into a movie because of that realism because of that connection because it really is truly somebody's experience and it really it becomes so invitational so yeah it's it's wonderful keep on writing my darling keep on writing oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes i am and now when I discovered computers in about 1981, when I started, work, actually I started working in 82, I got my teaching degree and uh, I was 42. And I worked in a computer center and I was teaching reading and writing. Mm -hmm. And it was an old fashioned computer center, but the yes. first time I could sit down at lunch and write a story. You know, right. write, write. <laughs> and I wrote an essay about my son who was in college. It's kind of a humorous essay. And um, somebody I knew that was a writer said, why don't you send that off to the Christian Science Monitor, that, that's a good piece, you know. I did and they published it. Mm -hmm. and I, I was just thrilled. I said, well, now I'm a writer. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna go forward. Exactly. And that's what I did. If I hadn't been in that computer room, I, didn't, I don't know. But right, yeah, I actually became an article writer when I first got a computer because I have dyslexia. So whenever I used to write, it was frustrating. Oh, oh so, I'm sure. Yeah. So when I started writing on the computer and it was easier to correct, uh -huh. you know, then kind of my voice, I discovered my own voice, you yeah. know, in, in the writing. Um, and so of course now I do my own bot, uh, podcast every week, which is a written article that I, I speak about. But it's uh, you know, it, that, it, for me, it became that liberation. And so whether you're writing it by hand or writing it by typewriter or writing it by computer, get it down, yes. <laughs> get it down. Yeah. And there was one sad thing, very, very sad thing. My grandfather in the First World War would send postcards to my grandmother. And there was a big, huge album of all of the postcards from wherever he was. And he also traveled a great deal to do with the timber business. He was all over the world and somebody stole it. It meant nothing to them. They probably stole them for the stamps and then we lost an entire, you know, thing story there, which was so upsetting. Oh dear. Well, that happened to my uncle uh, in World War I. He was a photographer, not, not a professional, but he had a beautiful albums he brought back and somebody stole them. Yeah. So and, and it means nothing to them. You yeah. know, they're looking at it for some other value and they don't realize the value that it actually has to the person and the people that, you know, that it's for. And it's just sad to see that. Yeah. You're, everybody's very happy to share. You don't have to steal. Yes, that's true. Yeah. But today you can say that on the computer too. So you always have yeah. something stuck or yeah, so exactly. Like Back it up, folks. Back it up. Yeah. And as you said, you're writing your own personal legacy, the legacy of your family, the legacy of your husband, wonderful for your children and your grandchildren. But for anybody else who's reading it, you're mimicking a story maybe they never heard from their own, you know, their own family or, you know, just being more engaged of what was really going on in life at that time that they never knew. You know, mm -hmm. through the storytelling, we've been telling stories since the beginning of time. And it's one of the most important things that we can ever do is keep the stories going, because that's truly how we learn and, and how we honor each other and how we also move forward. As it says in, in the Psalms of the Bible, that our, we live our lives like a story that is told. Yeah. But it has to be 
passed down and has yes. to be written down too. Yes. Uh, yes. It is a story. And yeah. uh, so it's, uh, it's a good retrospective for me, just looking back. Uh, and it's, it's a healthy thing to see where I was and where I've been and uh, how I've grown and how I've gone through situations I never thought I'd lose my mother when I was 25. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's, there goes the bill again. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but I'm better for it, I think. Yes. Uh, and, yes. Uh, and my Nolan book was kind of a tribute to my mother. So wonderful yeah. well now how do people get hold of the books and also how do they get hold of you well my website is sarah jane geary s-a-r-a-j-a-n-e-g-i-e-r-e.com and i have uh <clears throat> i'm on facebook and twitter and all that but uh they can contact me through that through my website and they the book is available at amazon um it's also you can order it. It's on the Ingram list, which means you can order it at Barnes and Noble. It's not on the shelf, but they'll order, they'll right. send it to your house for you. Yeah. Uh, and Walmart and other different places. So, and I uh, uh, go to book fairs here in New Jersey and uh, different ways, but uh, that's how they can get in touch with me. And I'd love to hear from people and see what they think. You know, and I think this is a wonderful thing to have in the family library and just you know, kind of encourage the family to read it because, you know, then it opens up the kids' conversation, you know, to, well, what were your parents like, mom and dad? And, you know, um, you know the, anytime that, I say inspiration begets invitation. Anytime you're inspired, you're invited, you, you know, to want to know more or want to do more. And you never know who you're going to ignite into wanting to write and share their stories or, or what Absolutely. story is going to have an impact on their life or how it maybe even pivot them into a different direction. But, you know, it, the books are to be read and shared and talked about because they're a wonderful way of, of really bringing up a subject. You know, how often do we talk about the Vietnam War today? It's all the Afghanistan War. Or, and we do movies on the, say, you know, the first and second uh, world war. But, you know, it's see it from a different point of view and start the conversation going because conversations lead to more wonderment, lead to possibilities, lead to action. And it can stem from a book. Bernard used to speak in uh, high school. I had a friend who was a history teacher and uh, he was always impressed by that, the playback between the teenagers and the experience. And I got it from this gal too. Now I have a, a high school gal helping me uh, do some of my posting and things like that, uh, busy work. And uh, she's learning too from me. Yes. What it's like. So. Uh, well, when yeah. is the next book coming out? Uh, well, um, starting on it, and I'm hoping in a couple of years, we'll see. I'm going back to Missouri probably this summer, and then I'm meeting some of my uh, Palmer girls, some of my cousins, uh, second cousins, for the first time in years uh, in April in Florida. They invited me down. They read the book. And they said, well, you're a Palmer girl, too. So you come down and see us at our townhouse. And so I'm gathering all these histories and yeah, uh, their, their dad was my first cousin. He was an admiral in the Coast Guard, and he used to go to D.C. and research the Palmers but way back in England. So I'm going to get all that information. And Wonderful. I got to put it together. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And you've got the due diligence to do that. As I said, you know, you you were a historian without knowing it. Right? So. Well, that's why my cousin sent me all this uh, memorabilia uh, when my grandparents died. He said, mm -hmm. "There's only one historian in the family, and you're it, kid." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And Everybody just, else said, no, I'll pass. <laughs> you're right. It, it does take work. It does take uh, diligence, but it also is that wonderful curiosity of, you know, of discovery, you know, just on the few things that I've learned about my own family, about my grandfather. I thought mm -hmm. my grandfather died when my mom was 12, only to find out he was uh, a colonel in the, um, in the British Army in India, and wow. he had a nervous breakdown, and he ended up in, in an asylum. And instead of owning that he was in asylum, they um, said he was dead. And so my mother, from the age of 12, thought her father was dead. Oh, my God. But that's a story. There you yes. have it. My gosh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And every time these type of things come up, it goes like, what? You know? And it's, it's a good reflection. It's definitely a good reflection. Um, sometimes it helps us put the future right. 
and you know sometimes it is a wonderment of all the courage and strength that are that have gone before us mm -hmm. and you know it's it's also just something also to be very proud of right we've all got a story in us we do we do yeah. and I'm, I'm very happy that i published this book and and i'm just overwhelmed with the uh, reaction i've gotten from it so it's very and, you know it's something that really, it. it's something that should be in schools as well because it's you know a wonderful reading that then can be discussed you know in the schools about opening up the conversation you know on als and you know on the the art of writing letters and keeping love alive on the war from a different perspective and opening up the whole conversation on war you've got so many yeah. avenues there that can open up so i think it's you know it's important to have in schools too good well my um one of my grandchildren he's graduating from um high school and he wants to be a history teacher and so he <sighs> He was named after my husband, Bernard, uh, Bernard Geary, and, and his Matthew Bernard Geary. And so he's going up to school, to college, and I've been uh, giving him, gifting him some of the memorabilia that I have from, from his grandfather, from, from the war. Right. Uh, and uh, he appreciates it. Yeah. He loves it. So yeah. I gave him a big poster, a World War I poster uh, the other day. So uh, I'm blessed that there's somebody of all my seven grandchildren that really wants to be a history teacher. Yes, exactly. Wow. See, the historian yeah. Fred is carrying through. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he was. There's some. There's there's so much to write about. You just yeah. have to. If I could just, if I could just invent a pill that kept me awake 24 hours a day, I could probably get it done in the next I know. book. Yeah, it's. A, if only it's, there was more time in the day. Yes, but you know what? It it's again you know a lot of times people look at people even over 60 and think you know out to pasture you're no good anymore and i love it when people in their 60s 70s 80s and even 90s have decided to explore something else because it ain't over until it's over and if you've still got <laughs> it in you you still continue to do it right absolutely yeah right so you know we're not out folks we've still got very much to give and and i think bridging that gap again from from the elders to the youth is the most beneficial thing that you can do as well. So, I think so. so folks reach out for this book um, and it's there on Amazon, also on Barnes and Noble. Um, My Pilot, a story of uh, war, love and ALS. There's so much to be learned there. Um, you know, there's so much as a couple you could read about learning how to love one another through the difficult times. And mm -hmm. uh, take a look at her site, Sarah Jane, and that's S-A-R-A. J A N E Greer G I E R E dot com, and uh, just let it spark an interest in keeping some of your own relevance of your own story and your own history, because there's always going to be somebody who's want to want to know all about it. That's right. Yeah, it, it's it's a blessing, and yeah. I'm just so happy to be with you today and talk about. It. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so I much for coming. You've got quite a story to tell, too. I oh, yeah, I've got to get going with that. It's like, <laughs> if I stop doing eight to ten shows a week, then maybe I'll have time, but I'm going to have to carve out some time for it. So, yeah, I know I've been nagged at people that I have to have it done. So I've just got to carve out the time for it. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing here. It's been an absolute delight. Well, I feel the same way. I'm very pleased to have met you and... Uh... I'm really thrilled to be on your show. Thank you so much. Thank you. And folks, remember, history is something we learn from. It's something we learn appreciation. We learn value. We learn respect. We also learn things that should not be repeated. And the more we share that history through beautiful stories, through things that we connect with, from people that have lived it, the more we have a better understanding of where we are today, what opportunities and possibilities lie before us, but also in that it doesn't matter if it's yesterday that doesn't mean to dismiss it because we carry yesterday with us and every day moving forward until next time bye for now we hope that you enjoyed the show right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com please tune in to our selfdiscoverymedia.com slash shows and you will see all the other genres that we have from you every week on tuesday we bring you new shows from illuminating people if you know someone that should be interviewed please contact us at info at selfdiscoverymedia.com now stay tuned for your next show